High in the heart of Asia, the Himalayas have long been treated as eternal, vast, white, and immovable. In the public imagination, they are monuments to endurance and sacredness. In the classrooms of geology, they are living laboratories of plate tectonics. Yet beneath that serene surface, a different story is being told by instruments and rocks, a slow-motion crisis in which enormous strains have been stored for centuries. New deep rock analyses, combined with decades of geodetic and paleoseismic work, paint a picture in which large sections of the Himalayan megathrust are locked and accumulating energy. The question researchers now pose is blunt and alarming. How long can this locked system hold before it fails? And what will failure look like for the hundreds of millions of people who live in its shadow? The tectonic engine that builds the Himalayas is straightforward in concept and complex in consequence. The Indian continental plate has been pressing into the Eurasian plate for tens of millions of years, a collision that continues at a rate measurable by satellites and field campaigns. That slow but relentless motion, on the order of a growth of a fingernail each year, has uplifted rock into some of the highest topography on Earth and driven enormous stresses along a broad, shallow fault zone known as the main Himalayan thrust. Beneath the surface, the thrust is a sheet-like interface where the Indian plate dives and the Eurasian crust rides above it. Where that interface is free to slip, earthquakes regularly release strain, where it is locked, strain accumulates silently like tension stored in a bow. Recent studies combining trench excavations, sediment records and geomorphic mapping confirm that some segments of this thrust have not experienced a major rupture for many centuries, marking them as seismic gaps that are now the focus of intense scrutiny. History provides sobering context. Written and archaeological records, together with paleoseismic trenches, show that the Himalaya region has produced very large onshore earthquakes in the past that reshaped landscapes, altered river courses, and flattened settlements. Events in the distant past, documented episodes from the 16th century, and more recent catastrophic quakes in the 19th and 20th centuries demonstrate a pattern of episodic, high-energy rupture across broad swathes of the range. Of special concern is a stretch beneath western Nepal and the neighbouring Indian state of Uttarakhand that appears to have remained unbroken since the early 16th century. That interval, spanning well over five centuries, suggests a tremendous accumulation of elastic strain that could be released in a single large rupture. Recent peer-reviewed analyses interpreting trench logs and historical chronicles argue that this segment represents one of the largest seismic gaps on land anywhere on the planet. The memory of modern shaking is vivid for millions. The catastrophe in the year 2015, when a magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck central Nepal, remains a living reference point. The event generated intense local shaking, toppled heritage structures, and triggered deadly avalanches on high slopes, killing thousands and displacing millions. Yet in tectonic terms, that rupture was partial. Geophysical reconstructions indicate that the main break propagated only across a relatively limited length and did not fully liberate strain trapped on adjacent sections of the megathrust. As a result, the 2015 quake reduced risk locally but left larger stores of strain intact elsewhere along the thrust. That residual reservoir has drawn sustained attention from seismologists who warn that a future rupture across a longer portion of the locked fault could produce far greater intensities and longer duration shaking. Modern instruments now provide the evidence that the fault is loading. Networks of global positioning system stations, combined with radar satellites that can detect millimetre-scale ground movement, register how the crust is deforming over time. In certain sectors, the land is creeping slowly yet steadily towards the thrust, while in the critical locked zones, little surface motion is observed despite the overall convergence. This mismatch, plate motion at the surface versus locked behavior at depth, reveals the accumulation of what geophysicists call a slip deficit, a direct proxy for stored seismic moment. High-resolution geodetic inversions and satellite interferometry studies have been able to map where that moment is concentrating and to quantify rates of strain accumulation across key segments of the range. In plain terms, parts of the fault are being wound tighter each year. 
If a major rupture were to occur across a long, locked stretch of the megathrust, the physics of seismic waves and local topography conspire to make the impact particularly brutal. A long rupture releases energy over a broad area and can produce strong shaking that persists for more than a minute, time enough to destroy vulnerable masonry and timber structures, to collapse bridges and to trigger massive landslides on steep slopes. In valleys and narrow gulches, seismic waves can resonate and amplify, effectively turning ordinary terrain into natural amplifiers of shaking. Rivers and lakes can be dammed by landslide deposits. When such dams fail, downstream flooding compounds the initial trauma. In some modelled scenarios, ground offsets of several metres are possible along rupture zones, an abrupt displacement that not only topples built structures, but severs lifelines, roads, power lines and pipelines across the region. The human geography of the Himalayas magnifies the hazard. Tens of millions of people live within reach of strong shaking, concentrated in both dense urban agglomerations and remote villages. Many historic towns grown around ancient routes and river valleys contain a high proportion of unreinforced masonry, stone and adobe dwellings, materials and construction practices that perform poorly under prolonged high-amplitude shaking. Hospitals, schools and critical infrastructure are unevenly distributed and in many locations not engineered to modern seismic standards. The combination of large exposure, Vulnerable buildings and challenging access for emergency services means that even a single prolonged rupture could generate devastation on a scale comparable to or exceeding the great historic earthquakes of the region. Yet the story is not only one of doom. The same scientific advance that reveals risk also opens pathways to mitigation. Geodetic and paleoseismic studies do not predict dates, but they provide spatial maps of relative hazard, where the strain is highest, where the faults have been silent, and where urban exposure is greatest. Researchers and engineers use those maps to prioritise retrofitting, to inform land use planning, and to guide the placement of critical facilities away from the most dangerous zones. In recent years, collaborative research among local institutions and international partners has expanded monitoring networks and improved modelling capabilities, clarifying where a future rupture would cause the worst societal impacts. Such information, if effectively translated into policy and practice, can sharply reduce the toll of a future event. The discovery that the Himalayan Foundation may be far weaker than long assumed changes the calculus of risk in ways that are both technical and profoundly human. New deep rock analyses do not merely tweak models, they rewrite them. Where classic imagery once suggested an unbroken granite-like platform beneath the snowfields, field crews and laboratory benches now reveal a different architecture. A quilt of fractured gneiss and schist, clay-rich seams that smear under sheer serpentinized mantle, and narrow zones of pulverized, water-saturated gouge. These are not poetic metaphors, but measurable conditions, zones where the rocks fail at far lower stresses, where slow, viscous creep can dominate over abrupt, brittle rupture, and where fluids act as lubricants that change how faults slip. The implication is stark. A weaker foundation makes cascading compound failure more likely than the tidy single-surface rupture once imagined. Those geological realities show up in many forms of data. Seismic imaging and crustal velocity models consistently identify a low-velocity layer beneath broad stretches of the range, often concentrated at depths of about 15 to 30 kilometers, about 9 to 19 miles, a clear signal that the mid-crust is fractured, altered or fluid-filled. Such low-velocity channels are not geological trivia, they change rupture dynamics. A propagating earthquake that encounters a weak, fluid-pressurized horizon can slow, accelerate or switch modes, producing long-duration shaking and widespread slope failure instead of a straightforward short-lived tremor. In short, the foundation behaves less like a monolithic shelf and more like a stack of cards in which a well-placed nudge can topple multiple layers. Field narratives give texture to the lab and remote sensing findings. One can picture researchers on a bone-cold ridge chipping a core that, when viewed under a microscope, reveals clay seams and micro-fractures that betray a history of repeated fluid pulses. A graduate student mounts the same core between steel platens, 
and observes its slide at stress levels that would leave intact host rock unbroken. Elsewhere, interferometric satellite images reveal subtle bulges in valley floors where deformation is accumulating, instruments that read what human eyes do not. These vignettes matter because they are concrete evidence that the megathrust is not a simple, uniformly strong interface, but a heterogeneous system of weak patches, sticky asperities, and fluid pathways. Those heterogeneities govern how, where, and when rupture initiates and stops. Scientific uncertainty about timing remains absolute. The data do not and cannot provide an exact date. What the evidence does do is narrow the where and the how, and it reframes the consequences. A weaker foundation makes cascading compound hazards more probable. A long seismic gap identifies where the largest releases of energy are most likely to occur, and the combination of those facts points to specific actionable priorities for mitigation. The moral clarity of that combination is hard to evade. Geological inevitability is not an argument for fatalism, but a call to sustained, coordinated action. Investments in monitoring, in retrofitting, in early warning, and in cross-border cooperation are investments in lives saved and cultural heritage preserved. They are not optional luxuries, they are pragmatic necessities. The Himalayas will continue to inspire awe, and their high peaks will long be places of pilgrimage, exploration, and livelihood. That coexistence of wonder and danger is central to the human story in the region. The new rock analyses that reveal a foundation less hard than previously imagined do not aim to alarm without purpose. They aim to inform action. If societies under the shadow of the range treat that knowledge as a spur to preparedness, upgrading buildings, expanding monitoring, strengthening cross-border cooperation, and investing in community resilience, the coming rupture, whenever it arrives, need not be a catastrophe that defines a century. It can instead be the moment when science and society together proved capable of bending the arc of consequence away from tragedy. Viewers are encouraged to share this synthesis, to bring the discussion into local planning meetings and schoolrooms, and to support organisations that work on seismic monitoring and community preparedness. If this video has raised awareness, subscribe to further analysis, share widely, and tap that hype icon so this story reaches a wider audience and spurs action before the Earth chooses to move again.